This is the month, as Mrs. Bloom mentioned, the month of Cheshvon. Cheshvon is what we refer to in our, our sages, referred to as Mar Cheshvon. It's the bitter month of Cheshvon. Why is it that it's so bitter? Because if you think back to what was during the month of Elul, when everybody was getting themselves geared up and ready for Rosh Hashanah, and then you have Rosh Hashanah where we make Hashem the king over us, and we begin thinking about the rest of our year, and Hashem is deciding life and death. And then there's the Yaseh Simei the ten days of repentance, where we are getting closer and closer and closer. And then Yom Kippur, which is the miracle of all days, where Hashem forgives us for everything that we did throughout the year. But it doesn't end over there. Once that we enter into the month of Tishrei, starting with Rosh Hashanah, it's Rosh Hashanah, ten days of repentance, then it's Yom Kippur, and then after that, several days later, is the beautiful Yom Tov of, of Sukkis, where we leave the home, we go into the Sukkah, we take our Dalit Minim, we spend time with the family, we get elevated, and we everything crescendos with the singing and the dancing on Simchas Torah at the end. So we have approximately seven weeks of a miraculous period of time in the calendar where everybody walks away feeling very connected to Hashem. Connected to the heritage, connected to the Torah, connected to the mitzvahs, everyone feels connected. Even the person that will tell you they're the most unspiritual person in the world, they also feel some kind of a connection. Comes along the month of Cheshvan, which is what we are in right now, and there is no special mitzvahs. There are no special Yom Im Tovim holidays, there's nothing special, quote-unquote, that we do to be able to elevate ourselves and lift ourselves up like we had the other days during Elul and, and Tishrei. And therefore the sages tell us, it's mar, it's bitter. It's a bitter month because when you're going so high, high, up, 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 and then it stops, it almost feels like someone pulls the rug out right from under your feet and a person falls, like a little child who is so excited that they begin taking their first steps and they're walking and the parents look like this and the child is laughing and the parents are smiling and the child is right and they're so excited. And then they can only walk so far. And then they fall on their face and they start crying. Often people feel after all of the holidays are over, they feel like that little child who falls on the face. Hopefully there was carpet there on the floor. And they begin to cry over what they're not doing anymore. However, it's not so dim and it's not so dismal what this month of Cheshvan is. Because I heard once from one of my Rebbeim, Rav Yossi Berger in Baltimore, that his father used to say, Mar, which means bitter, in the Hebrew language also means Mr. And the month of Cheshvan is Mr. Cheshvan, which means what? That if you want to see in a person how much they really accomplished throughout Elul and the month of Tishrei with all the holidays that are there. If we want to see that a person accomplished that they achieve, are they a mar, are they a mister, or a missus? Are they a real person that's solid and committed in their faith and what they took upon themselves? The month of Cheshvan, where we have nothing external to influence us, is the month where we really begin to see who a person truly is. If all of the words that we said in our prayers, all the promises that we made to Hashem, all the details, if it's really true or not. And I was thinking that the word mar, which means bitter, literally, if you switch those letters, mem, resh, backwards, you get resh, mem, which means ram. And ram means something that is elevated. That means that the month of Cheshvan is not a month where we have to go down. On the other hand, in a month where you can continue to soar and continue to grow the way that you were during the months of the Yomim, the Royim, and the holidays, that's the real Ramus Ha'adam, that's the real elevation of a person because you're doing it on your own. When, a, when you, a, a child is learning how to ride a bike, so they put training wheels on the bike. And the kid is riding down the street with a big smile on his face. He thinks he's the greatest person. He's able to ride a bicycle. He's not really riding the bike. Sure, he's sitting on the seat and his hands are on the handlebar and the big wheels are moving. 
But if it wouldn't be for the training wheels, he'd fall on his face. And sure enough, when he gets a little bit older and we say, okay, now it's time to teach you how to ride a bike like a big boy, and we take off the training wheels, he gets on the bike, he falls right away. He doesn't understand. I was able to ride before. How come I'm falling? Because those were training wheels. Now you have to ride on your own. In a certain way, Elul, which Hashem is so close to us, Rosh Hashanah, when Hashem is our King and He reveals Himself, says to me, Atshuva, when everybody can repent and get closer, Yom Kippur, where He forgives us for everything, and the Sukkot, which is the most amazing time of Simcha, of joy for the year, it's almost as if it's the training wheels for a Jew. And we've been riding the bike so successfully, comes along Mar Cheshvan and Hashem says, I'm taking away the training wheels, now I want to see you ride for yourselves. And therefore the month of Cheshvan is a very important month in the calendar, because it's really the beginning of showing to Hashem that everything that we said we meant, and the goals that we have in mind we're going to try to follow through with, and the inspiration that we, that we gleaned from these holy days that we had before us is something that we're going to try to live with as much on a daily basis as is possible. Which means then that the month of Cheshvan has to be something that starts off on the right foot. I was thinking this week, from last week's parsha, you see, Noyach was the only man he finds favor in the eyes of Hashem he's a tzaddik tomim he was the, the holy righteous man of his generation tomim he was completely pure and he is chosen together with his wife and his sons and their wives build the teva, build the ark go inside the ark for an entire year while the world is being destroyed by the mabel, by the storm, by the flood and all the animals and everyone that's in there is going to survive. And when it's over, Nayach, you have to go back into the world and recreate civilization. Recreate humanity. And make sure that the mistakes that were made before should not be made this time. So after the flood is over, Nayach now has his opportunity to shine as the builder of the new world and generation. But the verse tells us something very unfortunate. And Noyach, who was the man of the earth, was Yachel, he desecrated himself. And he planted a vineyard. What did he do that was so terrible? He comes off the, the, the table, the ark, He's excited to begin planting and building and starting all over again. He brought with him into the ark, he brought this, the, the, the zimra, he brought the vines from a kerem, from a vineyard. And the first thing that he does when he walks into the new world is, he plants the vine into the ground. And he's criticized harshly for this because the wine ended up leading to him getting drunk and being drunk we don't know the way Chazal explained it, not good things took place. And Noach went from being the tzaddik, tamim, the perfect righteous man, to lowering down his status altogether. So the Svarno on this verse over here says, what does it mean, v'yachel? Literally means when, that, uh, that Noach, by taking this vine and planting it into the ground and growing grapes and wine, he desecrated himself. So really, what's so terrible about planting grapes and having wine? We know wine we use for Kiddush on Friday night, Shabbos, wine by every bris that you go to, there's wine by every yomtiv that we have, wine we find is not such a bad thing, yayin, yisamech leiv, adam, it gladdens a person's heart. What did Nayak do that was so wrong over here by starting off and planting this vine? So the Sona writes, because Nayach began the whole recreation of the world, he started it off with an action that was not so becoming of who he was. And therefore, because he started off on the wrong foot, 
terrible things followed afterwards, which we can't even imagine. Because a little bit of a mistake in the beginning, a lot of bad can come out of that at the end. Says the Svarna, you know what his, his mistake was? You're starting. This is the first step into the new world. This is the first step of showing HaKadosh Baruch Hu that you realize the world was wrong before the Mamba, before the flood. Let's start all over again. And the first thing you do is plant grapes. And grapes you'll make wine. And wine you can get drunk. And if you get drunk, all the kikulim, all the terrible things that will happen. When you're starting off something that is, that is a giant project, when you're starting something off that is a way of life, you start on the right path, on the right foot. Now, as the month of Cheshvan is coming, it is upon us, as we said, we're literally starting on this path to show that everything we dedicated ourselves to during the Yom and the Roy, the holidays, and so on, we want to make sure that it lasts by us. Which means we have to make sure that we take steps in the right direction. One of the tzaddikim, the righteous men who was in the Holocaust in, the, in Auschwitz, his name was Rav Gershon Liebman. Rav Gershon Liebman was a disciple of someone who was known as the Altar of Navarduk, one of the great Musar personalities and giants of his generation. And Rav Gershon was one of his main disciples. He went through Auschwitz, and after Auschwitz was over, I know this because the man who was with him there told me, there was a tzaddik who used to come visit Los Angeles with Chaim Halpern, I don't know if anybody saw him when he was here, all the Rosh Hashiva from France, and he said that when he was in Auschwitz, he became a student, so to speak, of Rav Gersh and Liebman, and when the war was over, he told them, we're going to go and rebuild the yeshiva system of Navarduk from Europe. How are we going to do it? We'll figure it out. And they picked up and they went to France and they established over 40 institutions of schools for children, for adults, yeshivas, koilo, after the war was over. After everything was destroyed, they went and they built. But what was the first step of Rav Gershon Liebman? How did he know that he was going to be merit to be the one that's going to rebuild the Navardic yeshivas of yesteryear? How did he know that? So the story is as follows. When the war was over and the camps were liberated, so they were sitting there in Auschwitz in the DP camps. And for the first time they had some freedom. And there were chaplains, clergy that were coming in and out to make sure that the all the, 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 the inmates, the prisoners that were still, still alive, they were okay. And they would ask him if there's anything that you need. So Gershon Liebman, I don't know, it was like the day, two days after liberation. He's emaciated like a skeleton. He's lost his whole family, all of his friends, everything is gone. And he turns to one of the clergy there and he says, I need a Gemara. They said, how about some food? How about some clothing? How about a bed to rest? I don't need any of that. I need a tractate from the Gemara, from the Talmud. That's all that I want. So they go looking around into the town, wherever they go, and they find one Masech, the one tractate, Baba Kama, a very famous tractate. And they give it to Rav Gershon Liebman. And he sits down, and he begins learning. He hasn't learned in years since he was out. He begins learning. Somebody says to him, Reb Gershin, what are you doing? The war is over. We're free right now. What are you sitting here? He says, I'm starting a yeshiva. Starting a yeshiva, really? Where? Right here. Well, who are your students? I'm the first student. I'm the Rosh Hashiva, and I'm a student. Anybody who would like to join me, let them come and sit here and we'll learn together. The first step that Rav Gershon made after the war was over was something that testified to him and to Hashem that all of the years that the war were going, there was only one thing on his mind. 
If he'll survive, when he'll survive, if he'll live. He wants to make sure that he restores the crown to the Torah that was lost. And from that first step he picked up and he went to France and he built over 40 institutions of Torah that are still around until this very day. So we're in Cheshvan. Sukkot is over. Simchas Torah is over. Everybody can go on diets now. It's good. But now we have to make sure that we take the right step. And the steps have to be what is naos, what is beautiful and redeeming in the eyes of Hashem. So I was thinking the following. Cheshvan, this month, it sounds a lot like the word Cheshbon. Cheshbon is an accounting. Cheshbon Hanefesh. A person has to take an accounting, a Cheshbon Hanefesh. The only difference between the, the word Cheshbon and the word Cheshbon is the base and a Vav. Right? In the word Cheshbon, Ches, Shin, Vav, Nun. Cheshbon is Ches, Shin, Beis, Nun. The gematria, the numerical value of the Vav of Cheshbon is 6. And the numerical value of the Beis in the word Cheshbon is 2. The difference between those two letters is the number 4. What does the number 4 have to do with our growth in the month of, Ch- of Cheshvan. So the, the, the Gemara tells us the following idea. Tanur the rabbis have taught, Arba Tzrichin Chizuk. There are four things in life that require Chizuk, that require strengthening. And Rashi writes on those words, she is chazek adam behem tamid. A person must strengthen themselves in these four areas constantly. Be kol koychay with all of their strength. So what are these four things? The Elohim says the Gemara. Torah, which the simple explanation is our learning of Torah. Umaisim toivim, good deeds which refer to the mitzvahs. Tfila, our prayer, Vederch Eretz, and the way in which we deal with other people, our midas, our character, and its development, our Ben Adam the the way that we deal one person to the, to the next, and how we treat another Jew, another person. These four things are what a person is supposed to be mechazek, tamid, constantly in his life, they have to, they have to strengthen them. But perhaps if we'll spend the month of Cheshvan making a Cheshbon, making an accounting of these four things and recognizing that it's our, it's our pathway to success throughout the year, we will improve drastically in our lives and we'll be able to hold on to the inspiration that I'm sure each and every one of us felt throughout the holy days of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and the Simcha, the joy of Sukkot and Simcha's Torah. So I'd like to discuss a little bit in each of these four things, just to give us an idea. Again, it says over here, Torah. Torah, really, according to the way the Gemara explains, is talking about the learning that a person does in their Torah is something that should be increased and it should be deeper with greater understanding and more energy and effort that is expended and involved. I'm sure that you all learn and with pizza and candles there's no reason not to learn. The obligation that a person has to learn really is the, it's, a, it's a mitzvah that is dependent much more on a man than it is on a woman because our obligations in this world and what we have to fix inside of ourselves are two different things. So yes, you have to spend more time learning this year. You have to make sure you go to more shi'or and more classes. And if there's something that you are lacking that you want to hear about and you want to learn about, 
you'll tell Mrs. Bloom and Mrs. Gretel, and I'm sure they'll make an extra class just for you. So that's one area of our mitzvah observance, of, of, of Torah. But there's another aspect of Torah, which is our connection to the Torah itself. And there's a famous statement that Chazal teach us, which we find inside of the Chumash, that when the Jewish people were coming to Har Sinai to receive the Torah, and Hashem had gone to all of the nations of the world and asked them, do you want the Torah? They said, no, it's not for us. Do you want it? No, it's not for us. He came to the Jewish people and they answered, no, Nishma, excellent. With the same as, amount of enthusiasm as you, they answered it. They said, Nasivanishma, we will do and we will hear. We are so excited that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is giving us the Torah, we want it. After that, what did Hashem do? It says that He took the mountain of Har Sinai and He hung it over their heads and He said, If you accept the Torah right now, wonderful, you have a lot of blessing in your life. But if not, then I'm going to drop the mountain on your heads and that will be the end of the Jewish people. Sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? All of the commentators ask, why is HaKadosh Baruch Hu? They already said yes. They want it. They said, Nasev and Ishma. We're ready to do it. We're, we're able to do it. We'll learn about it afterwards, but let, well, let's accept it. Why is he hanging the mountain over their head? So the Maharal explains that he was teaching them a very important point. And that is that as much as you want to accept the Torah willingly, you must come to the recognition and realization that it's really a necessity. And it's something that not only do you want in your life, but it's something that you need in your life. Just like you can't live without oxygen, you can't live without water, pre you probably could live without, but bread you cannot live, what? It's debatable. It's debatable. Bread you cannot live without. You can't go so many days without basic sustenance. So too, a Jewish neshama cannot exist in this world, and the Jewish people will not continue unless we receive the Torah. Says Hashem, I want you to understand that. I know you want it. But one day in future, in the history of the world, there's going to be something called the Inquisition. And the Spanish nation is going to turn on the Jews, and they're going to want to kill all of you. And you're going to have a choice over there. And you might say, you know what, Hashem, when we accepted the Torah in our scene, it was so good to be a Jew back then. Miracles of the exodus of Egypt. It was the miracles of the splitting of the sea. We were the treasured nation, the favored nation. Well, of course we're going to accept the Torah. And we took it willingly. But now that it's not so easy to be a Jew, the, S the Spanish are rising up against us. They're trying to make an inquisition. They're burning us at the stake. We don't want it anymore. So here it is back. Hashem says, no, you can't say that. And that's why I'm hanging the mountain over your head. Because I want you to realize you can't live without it. You can't give it back. When it's too hard and too difficult, that's exactly the most that you need the Torah. There was just the other night in the valley, there was a memorial service for a very special Jew whose name was Saul Teichman. Tzichorim Livracha. He was one of the older Holocaust survivors that live here in Los Angeles, and he was a man of extraordinary faith. And they said over two things, again and again, all the speakers that were there. Many people that went through the war, they went through so much Gehenim, so much suffering and destruction and hardship, and they saw things with their eyes we can never imagine. They were traumatized for the rest of their life. Saul Teichman, anyone that knew him, I was fortunate enough to have a, a, a good friendship with him. Anyone that knew him never saw an ounce of trauma from the Holocaust in this man's life. Many people that went through the war afterwards, and again, we, we're not judging anybody, their faith wavered in Hashem because they couldn't believe what their eyes had seen and what they experienced. His faith through the war got stronger. 
And he said, you know why that was? While I was there in the death camps of Auschwitz, and I saw the enemy and the evil ways of the Nazis, Yemach Shemom, and I knew that Hitler, Yemach Shemom, was the one that was driving force behind it all, I thought to myself the following. If evil, when it harnesses all of its energy together, could accomplish so much destruction and so much bad in this world, imagine if a person will harness all the Kedusha, the holiness, and the sanctity, and the goodness, and the purity of Torah, and of mitzvahs, and the religion with Hashem, put that all together? Imagine how much the good can overpower everything else that there is in this world. And that became his mission after the war. He wanted to make sure that he showed the world as evil as they were and as much as they destroyed. If you're good and your neshama shines, you can add to this world things that nobody imagined a human being could, could accomplish. And he was a spokesman for Klau Yisrael. He was a builder of Torah for, for thousands and thousands and thousands of people, children, men, women, those that, were, those that were impoverished, those that were sick, those that were ill. All over the world you will find his name on buildings because he believed in the continuity of the Torah. Why? Because he saw if you put your mind and your heart to it, you could accomplish he said over an amazing story himself. It was one of the years that he was there in Auschwitz and Yom Kippur was coming. And on Yom Kippur, the Nazis were very ruthless people. And they kept track of the Jewish calendar. And they knew that Yom Kippur is the day that you're not allowed to eat if you're a Jew. So what would they do on Yom Kippur? That's how the big Rishayim, how wicked they were. They tried harder to get all of the inmates in Auschwitz to eat on that day. And they would literally force people to eat on Yom Kippur so that they wouldn't be able to fast. So Saul and his brother and a few other men got together and they said, no matter what, we are not eating on Yom Kippur. And he said, we were emaciated. The little food that we had was not, not substantial enough. They didn't drink, they didn't... They were physically falling apart. But he said, we made it through that Yom Kippur without putting a single morsel of food into our mouths. And you know what? At the end of the, of the day of Yom Kippur, we weren't weaker, and we weren't more shvach, what we would call more, more the, the disintegrating, so to speak, of our strength. On the other hand, we were stronger, and we were revived and rejuvenated because we were connecting ourselves to the world of Torah. Nasev and Nishma of Klau Yisrael is the statement that resounds throughout all generations that says, yes, we need the Torah. And yes, we cannot live without it. We understand that. But once that we're going to do it, we have to do it with a simcha, with a happiness, with a joy with an understanding that this is the best thing in the world that a person could possibly do for themselves. And therefore, perhaps in this month of Cheshvan, when we are charting our course for the rest of the year, we have to think, number one, Torah, what is that? That we want to strengthen our cheshik, our desire, our passion, our drive, our enjoyment of the Torah that we ourselves are connected to. And that's really the Arizal said about himself, the Arizal was the greatest Kabbalist of the last 500 years. He didn't even have a red string around his wrist and he was still a great Kabbalist. And the Arizal said, how did he merit to have all of these lofty levels? He was almost on the level of a sheer prophecy, the things that he knew. How did he merit it? because he did all of the mitzvahs and all of his learning and all of his connection to the Torah was all done besimcha with joy when a person approaches their connection to the Torah happy so much to be happy for you connected to Torah you have Torah in your life you see what's going on out there in the world today 
can imagine what's going on. Imagine if you weren't sitting here right now. Imagine if you weren't at someone's Shabbos table this past week. Imagine if you didn't have mentors the way that you do over here that can guide you and influence you and help put you in the right direction. Imagine you'd be somebody out there on the street doing who knows what, thinking who knows what, going who knows where. But you have the schus, you have the merit to be connected to the Torah and there's nothing greater than that. The second thing that it says in the Gemara over here is Maisim Toivim, good deeds. What are the good deeds? It refers to a person that is fulfilling the commandments that they have inside of the Torah. Which is an amazing thing if you think about it. What are the mitzvahs, what are the commandments called? Maisim Toivim, good deeds. They are good in and of themselves, and they are good for the person that is doing them as well. You go to the doctor, the doctor gives you the whole physical up and down, tells you what's going on in you, and he says, I'm going to give you some good advice. Drink eight glasses of water, you should eat more whole wheat, don't eat so much candy, not so much sugar, you should be exercising 30 minutes a day, stay off of drugs, stay off of alcohol, all the things, and you'll be a healthy person. Everything he's telling you is good in and of itself, but it's also good for you. The mitzvahs are maisim taivim, good deeds on their own, objectively and subjectively. The mitzvahs are good, but they are a great benefit to you as well. One of the great leaders of American Jewry who passed away already, it must be, I want to say it must be about 15 years ago now, was Rabbi Vigda Miller. He was an American-born boy. He went to Europe to learn at some point, he came back, and his mission was to inspire Americans to have great pride in their heritage and their faith and they should understand why they're doing what they're doing. One of his big things was that you should appreciate everything that Hashem does for you. And one of the places that he would, that he would express this most was in the way in which he would make blessings on his food. What would he do? He, would, he was caught many times talking to his food and there was nothing wrong with him. He would take an apple in his hand and he would say, Apple, you are so beautiful. Look at your color. You, there, was a, there was a seed that went into the ground. A beautiful tree grew. The apple, you grew from the branches and exactly the right color, Hashem changed your color so that the farmer knew that you were ripe and he plucked you off. And you ended up in my house, on my table, so I should have a snack. And look at you, apple. You're filled with vitamin C and this nu- nu- nutrient and that mineral. You're so delicious, apple. I'm so excited to be able to eat you. And then with a lot of kavan, a lot of intention, he would say, Baruch HaTo Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam, Boirei Peria Eit, and he would savor every bite. There was a young Baal Tshuva that was living in New York. This story goes back many years. I don't remember exactly his name. We'll call him Johnny. And one of the ways that Johnny became more religious was through the tape series of Rabbi Avigdor Miller. He has thousands of... Anyone knows what a tape is? Yeah? <laughs> yes? Okay. Yeah. Okay. My dad called. Oh, you dad okay. <laughs> So he has thousands of, thousands of tapes that he, that he recorded from all of his shiurim, all of his classes. And this boy Johnny used to like to walk around New York and he would take a Walkman. You know what a Walkman is? Yeah? He would take a Walkman with his headphones that had a string attached to it before they were cordless. And he would put in one of Rabbi Vigna Miller's tapes and he would walk through Central Park in New York getting his exercise and learning words of Torah. He would carry with him a backpack, and in that backpack was snacks. And eventually when he would get tired, he would sit down, take out the snack, and he would start to eat. So one day Johnny's walking through Central Park, he parks himself on a bench, he pulls out an apple, and he's been listening to all the tapes of Rabbi Miller, 
and he's looking and he says, Apple, you are so beautiful. And he goes through the whole dialogue together with the apple. And finally he says, oh, I'm so excited to be able to eat you now. And he says out loud in the middle of the park, Baruch atah Hashem elokeinu melech alam b'yreip your eights. And suddenly he hears a voice ring out, Omein! And he turns around, and none other than Rabbi Vigdan Miller himself happened to be in the park, was watching this young boy talking to the apple, and he saw him make the brach with all that kavan intention, and he answered, Amen. Those are my sim tayyivim, those are good deeds. An apple becomes a good deed. One bracha that you make in the morning on your cereal becomes a good deed. You do chesed, you act with act of kindness. All of these are amazing things. They're good on their own, <coughs> but they are good for the one who does them as well. So we have to strengthen ourselves in that area too. The next thing, number three, is <coughs> tefillah, is prayer. And the Gemara, we know the wonders of prayer, the powers of prayer. The Gemara tells us the following idea. Omar Rebbe Hanina. Rebbe Hanina says, Kol amarich anyone who extends and lengthens their prayer. Now, it doesn't mean that you have to dial in 45 minutes of a Shemon Esrei. But it means that you have to invest more energy, more time into understanding what you're saying into the words, so you'll be aware of that which you are saying and beseeching me for Hashem. Ain't filosoi chayzeres reikam, your prayer will not be returned empty. We all struggle with our tefillah, with our prayers. We have so many things that are going on in our lives, running here, running there. We set aside time for prayer. Then the phone rings right in the middle while we're in the middle of Shema I have to hurry up, but who's, who's what I'm missing? I pick up the phone, it's just one of those, you know, recorded calls over there, and I just, I just missed all of the beauty of tefillah. So the Rosh, one of the earlier Rishayim, who is in the same league as Rashi, he writes the following, When the time to pray arises, leave over or put down all of your involvements, and start to pray. That means, yes, you have to take the phone and you have to put it down. You can't be texting and davening Shman Esther at the same time. It doesn't work. You take it, you turn it off, and you put it over there. You're in the middle of uh, studying for an exam, and you realize the sun is going down, and you did not yet pray today. It's okay. Close the notebook. Close the book. Put the pen down, and pray to Hashem. There is no... I heard once many, many years ago from Rav... Uh, from from Rav Nassim Svi Finkel, who was the, the Rosh Hashiv of the Mir, he said, without fila, without prayer, there is no hatzlacha, there is no success in a person's life. So we all need to strengthen our prayers. And anyone that's mairich, that increases and lengthens and expands their kavana, their intention, or even their simple understanding of the words. We don't have to be mystical to understand prayer. Just get an art scroll, get a Mitsuda sitter, whichever one you like, and just look at the Hebrew, look at the English translation, simply put, and understand what it is that you are saying. If a person will do that, you can imagine, first of all, what your prayers are going to accomplish, but you can never imagine the connection that you are going to feel yourself to the world of prayer and of course to the one that's listening to our prayers to Hashem. This year during the month of Elul, I suddenly out of the blue came down with bronchitis. And I went to the doctor and he gave me one round of uh, antibiotics and it didn't work. So he gave me another round of antibiotics. In the meantime, while I was going through the bronchitis, it affected my throat and I, I, I couldn't, I was having a very hard time speaking loud, which is a very 
difficult thing for a rabbi to be struggling with during the month of Elul, Rosh Hashanah, 10 days of repentance and Yom Kippur, which for me crescendos at the very end of Yom Kippur when I lead the congregation in the Elul. So as the holidays were coming closer, my voice was not coming back. And I was, every time I spoke, my voice was cracking, and if I, I, you, if I was just struggling to get the words out. I made it through Rosh Hashanah, made it through a and made tshuva, right before Yom Kippur, the voice was going once again, and I was getting nervous. I'm, how am I going to give drushes? How am I going to daven the ilah? The whole Yom Kippur, I kid you not, the entire Yom Kippur, every drush that I gave, my voice was crackling and cracking, and I, it, was, it was fading out. I give one drush right before in the ilah, and at the end of that drush, my voice, gone. I'm telling you, gone. And I said, how in the world am I going to lead the congregation in the, the most probably important part of all of, of Yom Kippur? One of my sons had asked me before Yom Kippur, we have this kibbutzim, there's honors that we have in the shul. You want an aliyah to get called up to read from the Torah. Some are opening the ark at certain points are very auspicious. And we, we sell them. People can come and they can, they can buy it for $1,000, $1,800, however much it is. And it's a schus, it's a merit for them and it helps to support the shul as well. My son asked me before Yom Kippur, he said, Tati, did anybody buy the opening of the ark before Ne'ilah? I said, as a matter of fact, nobody did yet. So he said, I saved up some miser money, some my 10%. He said, if nobody buys it, I'm not going to take it away from anybody in the shul, but if nobody buys it, would it be possible to buy the opening of the ark before Ne'ilah? So I said, how much do you want to give? No. So I, <laughs> I said, I said, if nobody asks for it, and nobody purchases it, and you really want it, then yes, you can have it. He said, Tati, what's the segula, what's so special about opening the ark before Ne'ilah? I said, oh, you open the ark, it's the last opening, it opens up the gates of heaven for you, opens up all the blessings, opens up the world of Torah learning for the year, your prayers, the, the blessings, everything opens up for you. Okay, Tati, if nobody else takes it, I want it. Okay, we're getting close to the Ilah. My son comes to me be- right before Mincha, which goes, Mincha goes right into the Ilah. Tati, and I said, no, it's all yours. You want it, it's all yours. Okay? We get to the Ilah. My voice is gone. We start davening silent Shema Nesve. I have no idea where my voice is going to come from in the repetition. I look at my son after Shmon Esri is over and I tell him, okay. He opens the ark and I'm watching and he stands right in front of the Sifrei Torah, the Torah that is there and he doesn't move himself from that position. And he starts shuckling like this a little bit and whatever he said, he said, I begin my davening and suddenly I have a voice again. I cannot describe to you, my voice suddenly comes back full force like it never was before. I daven the entire thing, I, I don't know where the voice is coming from. We go to, back to my house after the meal, we're breaking the fast, and I said it was a nace, it was a miracle. I said my voice came back, I don't know where it's from. So my son tells me, Tati, I want you to know that when I opened up the ark, I daven for you that your voice should come back. This is the kayach, this is the power of prayer. Not only can we daven for ourselves for what we need, but we can daven for others as well. And if you mayach, if you extend your prayers and you extend your energy and your strength, it's not going to be returned empty-handed. Our Kodesh Baruch Hu is going to answer. And the last of the four things that we have over here is something, yes, He's 15 years old. that's 
the heartless, the heartless boys, we try to train them in the right way. <laughs> To be glossed over that part of the story. That's pretty phenomenal. Wow. The last of these four uh, aspects of our Avodas Hashem, of our service of Hashem, is what's called Derech Eretz. Derech Eretz is referred to in many places as the way in which we deal Bain Adam Lachavera one person to the other. Because a person could have all of the Torah under their belt, so to speak. They could have so much knowledge and so much wisdom. But as the Gemara says, that if a person represents Torah and then mistreats another person, they, they mistreat the Jewish people, they make what's called Chil Hashem, a desecration of God's name, says the Gemara, Oi, woe is to this person and woe is to the mother that gave birth to such a person. Because you represent Torah and then you act in such a way like that, we need to have working constantly on our derech eretz. And the way that we will do better with other human beings is that we are working on our midas, on our character, to refine ourselves, to recognize the pure nobility that is within us, to elevate our midas, our character above. What is the lowliness here that we find around us and be people that are precious and praiseworthy in the eyes of Hashem. The Vilna Goin, who was the greatest scholar and sage of his generation and probably for hundreds of years before that and no one ever reached his toenails even after that. The Vilna Goin writes, what is the purpose of life? Why did HaKadosh Baruch Hu bring you down to this world? Now we would expect the Vilna Goyim, who slept only two hours a day, which means he was up 22 hours a day, and he barely ate. He didn't go to Schnitzli over here for a good meal. He barely ate. He barely slept, which means the majority of his day was learning and prayer. We would expect, what's the purpose of life? purpose of life is to learn Torah become the greatest scholar that you can but he writes the purpose of life is to be misaking to correct and to fix your midas, your weakened character traits to be mishabra to break them the imlav and if a person doesn't do that lama loichaim why is the person alive we came to become, into this world, greater human beings, greater people. How do we do that? Cr- crush and change and redirect the Mida Yisrael, the negative traits that a person has. And this will lead us to a whole new way in which we're going to deal with the people around us. We know that there's a mitzvah in the Torah called V'yafto L'Riecha Kamaycha which means you have to love your fellow Jew the way that you love yourself. And the Mepharshim, the commentators ask, what does it mean, Kamaycha? How can you love someone the way that you love yourself? How can you do that? We love ourselves. We, we want the best for ourselves. We love everything about ourselves. We love that we, people will take... We love it. We love. How do you love somebody else the way you love yourself? So Rav Dessler in the Mikhtam in the Al writes, that the way in which a person creates Ava love for another human being is by giving and giving and giving to that person. And the more that you will give even to a total stranger, the more that you will care for them, the more that you will be concerned about them, the more that you will feel for them, the more compassion that you will have on them. So even a stranger who walks into a class like tonight, or walks out to a Shabbos table that you never met before, or some other event that you're going to, they will become to you like a car of like a family member. They will feel to you, mamish, literally, like they are a piece and a part of you. And therefore, the only way that I'm going to be able to excel in my Bein Adon Lechavir, treating another person in the right way, is if I work on myself, it means patience. Not everybody is as great as we are. Not everybody is not as annoying as we are. 
Not everybody has the best sense of humor the way that we do. Not everybody has the same interests which are the only interests in the world the way that I have. My daughter called me tonight and she was complaining that her class in whatever, fourth or fifth grade, it's clicky. There's so many clicks. So I told her, welcome to the female race. Yeah, That's the way that it works. And you better get used to that because that's how it's going to be for the rest of your tenure probably in school. And life. life. But, but, it doesn't have to be like that. HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't like clicks. He doesn't like when we look down and we judge other people. Ah, she can't come into my group. We're not going to call her to go out with us on this night, whatever it is. Shem doesn't like that. Why are we clicky? Because we have bad midas, bad character traits. We're not forgiving enough or understanding enough or open enough or gentle enough or merciful enough to let everybody into our circle. But if we would have real ava, real love for another Jew, which means that I give and I take care of them and I worry about them, then they become like, it's like a, a part of me. And of course they'll be let in. Last week, was the yurt site of Rabbi Vadi Yosef. I believe it was the eighth yurt site already, which is defies imagination how long it's been already. And Rabbi Vadi Yosef, besides being one of the most remarkable Talmud Chachamim, Torah scholars of the generation, his mind could compute things faster than a computer. There's certain computer programs that have a plethora of, of recordings of all the different swarm, all the different books that are out there on the shelf. And if you type in a certain topic, so this program will tell you all the different books that you can find that topic listed in. Sometimes they would ask Rabbi Vajra Yosef the same question that they asked to the computer, and he would say, a whole the same exact list, but even more. And they would say, what? Well, but the computer didn't say that. Well, the computer doesn't know all the svarim, all the books that I know. And everything was in his head. It was, it was, it was etched in stone. He had, a, he had an unforgettable brain. And besides being amazing in that world, he was tremendous in the way that he dealt with human beings. And his bein odem lechaver, which was generated by his very strong ahavas Yisrael, his love of the Jewish people. And there's a very touching story about him. That there was a young man who lived in Harnof in Yerushalayim where he lived. Who was in his Shana Rishon, his first year of marriage. And unfortunately his wife was diagnosed with an illness. And Rahman al-Islam within the first year of marriage, his wife succumbed to the illness and she died. And this young man was sitting Shiva. Imagine the simcha of standing under the chuppah, the joy of starting a house, sitting in, in Jerusalem, learning the Torah over there, building what they're hoping for and dreaming a family together. All of that taken away. This young man, unconsolable. No matter who came to the house and offered words of compassion and consolation, nobody could even penetrate the heart of this young man. Somebody had an idea. This young man was Sephardi, and Rabbi Vali Yosef, who was the chief rabbi of Sephardi Jewry, lived in Harnof. And they came to Rabbi Vali and they said, there is a, such a tragic story. A young husband who lost his wife in the first year of marriage, he's inconsolable right now. Perhaps, Rabbi Yosef, if you will come and pay a shiva call, and offer him consolation, maybe it will help. And Rabbi Vajra Yosef, who didn't waste a minute of his time, who was always busy learning, or writing answers to people's questions, or counseling, whatever it was, he said, of course, let's go immediately. And they quickly went to the house where this young man was sitting Shiva. And of course, when the leader of Sephardi Jewry walks into the room, everybody stands up including the man that's sitting Shiva himself. And Rabbi Vajra walks over to him and he takes his hand and he tells him, sit, 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 shouldn't be standing for me. And he takes him and without a word he sits the man down on his low chair 
And Rabbi Vajra sits down on the floor next to him. And without saying a single word, Rabbi Vajra Yosef breaks out crying uncontrollable tears. And as Rabbi Vajra is crying, this husband who lost his wife begins crying. And the two of them sit there for a long time crying together. At the end of all the tears, Bavaja stands up. He offers the traditional words of consolation to a mourner. And he walks out. The young husband who was sitting there, left in the house, said, Nobody was able to offer me consolation until Rabbi Vajra Yosef came and did what he did. When you go into the shoes of another person, when you're compassionate, when you're kind, when you're understanding, when you're merciful, when you love another Jew the way that you love yourself and the way that you would want to be treated and understood is the way that you treat and understand them, so then you have succeeded in the world of Derech Eretz, of Ben Adam Lachavera, one Jew to the next. And you have succeeded, as we say, in, in elevating your midos, taivas, your beautiful traits that you have. So as we are embarking, we already began our journeys in the month of Cheshvan. This Mar Cheshvan, it's not Mar, it's not bitter. On the other hand, it's Ram, it's elevated, it's lofty. If a person learns from the, from the mistakes of Noyach, and they embark upon the month with the right steps, and they go in the right direction, and they tell themselves, I'd like to hold on the best that I can to whatever his arus, whatever elevation I had during the month of Elul, Yom Deroim, and Sukkis, then you'll certainly go in that direction. With doing what? Make a cheshbon, make an accounting of these four things as we said. Number one, Torah, which is your learning. Don't give up on your learning. Go to the classes that interest you. Find someone to learn with. Take a book. There's so many English books that are out there today. Hashem is taking away all of our excuses to learn more about what it means to be a Jew. When we're going to go after, up after 120 years, ask, why didn't you do this one? Well, I, I, what, what do you want? I, I couldn't read Hebrew. Hebrew? Did you ever hear of Art Scroll? Did you ever go into the mitzvah store over here and see a uh, hundred different books in English, if not more, about every single topic under the sun? So keep learning. But your connection to Torah as well has to be something that fills you with joy. Recognize and see how sweet it is to be a Jew. How sweet it is to be connected to Torah, because the Torah is what connects us to Hashem. The second thing that we mention is Maisim Torah, which is mitzvahs. Mitzvahs themselves are good deeds, and they're also good, like the medicine that the doctor gives us, and it's healthy for us. And if we see how good it is, that itself elevates us and brings us to new levels in our Avodas Hashem. Third of all, we said our tefillah, our prayers. Let's not forget that if we spend just a little bit more time and we turn off our telephones and our phones and our computers and whatever other gadgets we have buzzing us all day long, we just turn it off and we close the books and we turn off the TV and we say, okay, I'm going to just pray now. Five minutes, that's all that I need. Five minutes, ten minutes. And I'll pray to Hashem. Our prayers are not going to go unanswered or returned. HaKadosh Baruch will listen to what we say and even if you're davening for somebody else and what they need Hashem will listen to your prayers and the last thing as we said Derech Eretz which is this beautiful way in which a person is going to increase and improve in perfecting their midos, their character trait and through that they will then deal with the other people around them in the right way we won't get annoyed and upset frustrated with people suddenly you'll have patience. Often, husbands and wives come and they're complaining about each other, fighting, arguing, bickering. And often the wife, I'm not saying, but often the wife will begin the argument 
And then she's screaming in that high-pitched voice. The husband can't handle it, so what does he do? He gets very defensive, and he starts screaming back at his wife. So I tell the husbands all the time, if you will not scream back, and you will talk softly, as the Ramban writes, if you want to conquer anger, just talk softly, then besides the fact that it will drive your wife crazy if you do that, but you will defuse the situation in a moment, that will be the end of the argument. But we have to work on ourselves. And if we work on ourselves, we become these noble beings here in this world who are zeiche, to have chizuk, tomid constantly in these four areas. And then the month of Cheshwan is elevating its ram, it brings us up. And in that way, we hold on to the fires of the Yomim Neroyim, the Simcha of Sukkot and Simcha's Torah, and ultimately, Be'ez HaShem, with all of our hard work, HaShem will say, Oh, now I see that you really want to be close to me. I'll bring the Bias Goyot Tzedek, the coming of Mashiach Tzidkeinu, Bimheira V'yomino.